Good evening, guys, and uh, welcome. And uh, as you just heard, uh, my name is Kevin Rooney, and welcome to our IrishBorderPool.com this evening. Um, the title of the debate, Brexit and the Protocol, Bad for the Union, Good for Irish Unity, question mark. And uh, I'm editor of IrishBorderPool.com. And uh, in case you don't know, IrishBorderPool.com is a, is a Britain-based organisation where we try to raise debate about the need for a border poll uh, and the United Ireland and put on debates like this. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our three speakers tonight. Delighted to have them. We've got Brian Feeney, uh, Irish news columnist and board member of Ireland's Future. And Brian will speak first. And then we've got Ben Collins, author of Irish Unity, Time to Prepare. And then third, we've got Kevin Maher, regular Irish Border Poll contributor and author of Ian Edit Ireland, Why Unification is Inevitable and How It Will Come About. So a couple of quick wee things, guys, before we get into the speakers. So this is going to go on to 8 p.m. Uh, we'll be short and sharp and uh, we'll knock it on the head at 8 o'clock rather than let it drag on. And uh, each speaker will give their fairly brief opening remarks. Uh, I have like up to half a dozen questions I may ask them, but I might not get through them all. Um, and after I ask them a few questions, you start finding your comments and questions and you can be doing that now. And Sean, who's in the background, will basically integrate those questions and feed them to me and into the discussion. And I would say everybody who, who's watching or listening, please don't be shy. There's no such thing as a stupid question. So just get them in when you can. And um, just to repeat, we have two people in the background. One is Sean, um, who will take your, your questions and feed them into the discussion. And just to say out loud as well, a big, a big thanks to Harley, who's the bald guy you might see, um, I think, who's in the background pulling all the levers and pressing all the buttons and making things go smoothly because everybody knows that I'm pretty much um, computer illiterate. And if something goes wrong, I wouldn't know what to do. So thanks, Harley. And thanks, Sean. Final thing, the sorts of questions we're trying to get through tonight would be, does the protocol strengthen or weaken the union? Have unionists themselves weakened the union? Will the protocol lead to an economic United Ireland? It, and if we get that far, perhaps, is the North dysfunctional and even irreformable, question mark? And where is the union debate at? at the moment and what's the way forward from here. It's perhaps wishful thinking we'll get through them all, but let's let's try. I think without further ado, I'm going to shut up. And Brian, if you can hear me, over to you for your opening thoughts and remarks about where we're at with this whole uh, Windsor framework protocol and Brexit. Brian, it's brilliant to have you as well. So on you go. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Um, I'll start from where we are. Um, and that was the arrival of Rishi Sunak to sell his own uh, framework deal. And the interesting thing is that he decided to go to uh, the Coca-Cola uh, canning plant in uh, Lisburn. Um, it's no coincidence that that's in Jeffrey Donaldson's constituency. And what Sunak was doing was telling everyone what a wonderful opportunity, uh, the, uh, the fact that the North is in the single market for goods, what a wonderful opportunity that is, and that you could sell produce all over the island. It's a big irony, and this irony was brought up in the House of Commons when people were asking him, why are you doing this? Why are you telling him what a great thing the single market is? Why can we not have this in Scotland? Why can we not have it for the whole of the UK? And he went on to say, it's because Northern Ireland is a special case. Now, this special case that he's talking about is actually going to drive um, economic unity on the island because the Coca-Cola plant that he visited in Jeffrey Donaldson's constituency uh, cans Coca-Cola for the whole of the island and the transport north, south, south, north is absolutely vital for that. There's another very good example of economic unity on the island and that's the fact that in East Belfast, Guinness is bottled and canned for the whole of the island. And after the protocol came in, the uh, plant in East Belfast doubled its capacity. So what happens is Guinness is brewed in all sorts of varieties in Dublin. It's sent north in lorries, which each contains 30,000 litres 
and they're called silver bullets. And they come north and they're canned and bottled in East Belfast. And they doubled the capacity after the protocol came in in 2021. It, they can now do 72,000 cans an hour in East Belfast. Once they're canned, they're then sent back to Dublin and then they're exported around the world. So the fact that Sunak chose to do this, it was a demonstration of the possibility of a, an economic United Ireland. The other development in the last two years has been the expansion of Ross Lair and Dublin Port. And not just the expansion of the port, <clears throat> Ross Lair, for example, has invested 400 million euro in expanding. But it's not just the expansion of the port, it's the expansion of the ferries which used to go from Ross Lair to Cherbourg. Uh, that was pretty well it. Um, but now there are ferries to Dunkirk. There's one developing to Zeebrugge, um, and there's another one going to Santander. So it's now going to be more convenient for people in the north, for lorry drivers, truck exporters, to go south instead of going through England and being held up forever <clears throat> at uh, traffic jams in Dover, going through all the problems of trying to get to the mainland Europe through British ports. It's very simple. Uh, the, the development of transport on the island of Ireland in the last two years has been absolutely phenomenal. So what's happening is that Brexit is driving an economic United Ireland and it's going to be profitable for everyone. The same thing applies to farmers. Most land in the north goes south and then to mainland Europe. The north produces too much milk to be consumed here. So the milk goes south. It's made into yogurt. It's made into cheese. And then it's exported to mainland Europe. So Brexit is actually driving um, Irish economic unity. And this new deal is not going to go away. It's going to be passed by a big majority in the House of Commons. There will be a, a small minority of wingnuts who are against it, but it's going to go through. And what Sunak is after is developing the relationship between Britain and the EU. It's not just about the north of Ireland. It's developing and resetting Britain's complete uh, relationship with mainland Europe again. And the interesting thing is at the meeting in Windsor, Ursula von der Leyen said that the British government would be able to get into the Horizon programme immediately. And the Horizon programme is a programme for research and innovation, which is worth 95.5 billion euro. And that's the sort of thing Sunak is after. It's, it's not putting sausages across the Irish Sea. Brian, that's brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant start. Thank you very much for that. And I'm very, very informative straight away. Um, I think without further ado, Ben, if you can hear me, we'll pass it over yep. to you for your opening thoughts, mate. Okay, thanks, Kevin, and thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, and uh, it's great to follow on from uh, follow on from Brian. I agree with everything you've said, and you've included an awful lot of information there. Uh, from my perspective, I think it is good to see this this deal. It's been a long time coming, and whether it was just media interpretation or there generally were some some wobbles in the run up to the. Uh, the formal announcement it's, it's great to see and i think it strikes me that rishi sunak is somebody who recognizes that he may only have two years in government as a prime minister and therefore he he wants to have some some wins under his belt and i think he's a pragmatist um i think you can see the bigger picture you don't get to be chancellor of the exchequer without having a good understanding of the uk economy and he recognizes he needed to unblock this and being stuck in the middle between the eu and the us is not a good place to be whenever you're the only uh, major economy in the G7 uh, and also including Russia, which is uh, showing, uh, which is which is in recession and is predicted to be in recession. Um, I live in Belfast, but I work out of Dublin and it's very noticeable uh, on a, on a, on a granular level as well as a strategic level to see the difference in the, in the economies and the expectation of the economic growth between the UK and, and Ireland. I think um, it is. It's a, it's a good deal. Uh, of course, I would have preferred that we had never left the EU in the first place. But given the fact that that decision was taken and the UK government decided at the time to go for a very hard Brexit, this is the only option because there needs to be a border somewhere. 
and everyone agrees, UK government, Irish government, EU, US, that there cannot be a hard border on the island of Ireland, and therefore the only option is to have one down the Irish Sea. Now, I welcome the fact that uh, the EU and the UK have uh, have taken further steps to to mitigate that, but there is still uh, there are still barriers. But the very fact of Brexit is about putting barriers in place. It's not the free trade uh, nirvana that uh, that was that was first surmised because if you leave a club, you uh, you don't get to have access to all its benefits, uh, and you have to pay, and you quite often have to pay a heavy price to get lesser benefits. But um, I think what is going to be interesting is the DEP have been able to keep their party together over the last um, year, 18 months, by, as uh, Sam McBride described it, by Jeffrey Donaldson acting as um, Jim Allister light. And now he's having to open himself up to considering whether um, the DEP should, should agree to go back into government. But the challenge is that whenever you do that, that opens yourself up internally to to criticism, as we've already seen from a number of, of senior representatives, particularly at Westminster. So I think that's going to be interesting. And I guess one of the other things to bear in mind is that in many ways, Jeffrey Donaldson made his career back in 98 by walking out of the Good Friday Agreement. Can he actually change the habits of a lifetime and not walk out to stay at the table, to fist down the naysayers? And, do, and it's, he doesn't actually have to do the deal. The deal will be done over his head. Rishi Shunak has already said that. It's not open to renegoti renegotiation. And those are suggesting that more needs to be changed. It's just, it's not reality. And I think this suggestion, the DEP are going to take months to decide. Well, they can they can if they want, that's their prerogative. But by then, they, there will have been a vote in Westminster. And I think it will be passed by overwhelming numbers, um, just as, uh, as Brian has said. And um, I think what we will find out is, is the DEP willing or able to even begrudgingly accept the deal, and will they accept democracy? That is uh, a Sinn Féin first minister. I think that is that is a significant question, and the DUP will have to decide, and Jeffrey Donaldson will have to decide: is it more important to do what's right for the region and its people, or is it more important to try and keep their party together? Brilliant, Ben. Um, great start as well. And uh, let's um, go straight over to yourself, Kevin, if you can hear me. I can. Good evening, everybody. Um, Brexit and the protocol, bad for the union, good for Irish unity, the question. Uh, the short answer is yes, uh, but then everything is bad for Northern Ireland and the union these days. Um, we're in zugzwang, as they call it in chess. The game is not quite over, but the outcome is certain. Every move by the losing player weakens their overall position. They are locked in a death spiral. Defeat is attritional and assured. That's where Northern Ireland is, making less and less sense. Election results, demographics, changing nature of Southern Ireland in recent decades, socially and economically, changing face of modern Britain, not least the prospect of Scottish independence, are the dry tinder, and Brexit is the accelerant poured over them and then set alight. Um, and something else, it's important to recognise um, on the general question around Irish unity that it's a process before it's an event. And we are very much in that process and Brexit is very much a part of it. So why does Brexit matter? Um, it's bad for the union because it forces a conversation about Northern Ireland's place within it. It brings to the surface all the anomalies, the fact that the North is as close to Britain as France is, the fact that it has a land border with the rest of Ireland and therefore the EU, the fact it has a peace agreement that prices in and facilitates a change of constitutional outcome, the fact that the recent past has been obviously so troubled and destructive. Um, you know, it's hard to overestimate just what a hash uh, the DUP has made of things um, in relation to Brexit and the protocol over recent years. Um, they backed Brexit lustily and to the hilt, basing their analysis, I think, on the reductive calculation that anything which made Northern Ireland less European automatically laid it, made it less Irish. Um, they positively salivated over the prospect of a 310 mile hard border replete presumably with razor wire, watchtowers and barking Alsatians, but that was never in prospect. There was no appetite in Westminster ever for a hard border, except in the minds of the bronze, the Brit romantic nationalists, the DUP, TUV and parts of the ERG. And combined, of course, these lot make uh, another three letter word, MAD. Um, no one serious ever entertained the idea, which meant given our European friends are rather partial to their grub, that if we were not checking goods on the actual border, then we had to do it at the ports. For unionists, this amounts to a border in the Irish Sea, but it is either that or the razor wire and the watchtowers. 
and the destruction, as Brian pointed out, of the Northern Irish agricultural sector, given so much milk is processed across the border. So the protocol was the inevitable appendage to Brexit. Northern Ireland had to be treated differently. Theresa May understood that. So she tried to keep all parts of the UK in the customs union, which the DUP opposed and voted against and got rid of her. Boris Johnson understood it too, which is why he agreed to the protocol in the first place. And Rishi Sunak, is, who is at least a responsible adult, has had another bash this week at getting Brexit done again. He secured an agreement with, with three parts, I think. Um, the red and green lanes <clears throat> for the export of goods from Britain to the north and, and the collection of real-time data and the sharing that with European officials was part of the package of measures proposed by the Irish government and the European Commission back in October 2021. There are parts of the package that, that he secured, which through reasonableness, he has won some concessions from the EU around repatriating state aid, so subsidies and, and VAT and excise powers. And then there are parts of this package, this, this, Windsor, um, this Windsor framework, which are pickled in bromides. So this storm and break, which is anything but, we can probably talk about that a little bit later. I think the EU has essentially taken a risk-based approach to all of this and concluded that Northern Ireland is too small to bother with, um, so it can be a bit more light touch in its approach. Now, Sunak, um, as Ben pointed out, has won plaudits across his party and the national media for the deal. Universal coverage on the front pages of the British papers the other day, very positive for him, certainly more positive than he's had in his time as prime minister. Um, and this deal is full and final. That's it. It isn't going to get any better for unionists. It's not going to be renegotiated. He's not going to go chasing down the street, shouting after Ursula to say, can I just uh, change one or two parts of it because Jamie Bryson's not happy with it? That's your lot. That's it. Ultimately, in the, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, in, in the, in certainly in the, the British perspective, Northern Ireland simply doesn't matter in the big calculations. It comprises one and a half percent of UK GDP. And unionists account for the same percentage of the UK population. And if Sunak is right, and Northern Ireland is the world's most exciting economic zone, which is what he said when he was at that uh, canning plant the other day, it is because of the potential benefits of being in the European single market. Let's be clear about that. In which case, that growth will see Northern Ireland absorbed deeper and deeper into the single market, and by extension, the Irish economy, hastening the integration of the two economies. We've already seen that happen over the past two years with the trade patterns and supply chains that have changed as a result of the original protocol. So even with a Sunak deal, <clears throat> it's unlikely that things will swing back to where they were. So we're back to Zugzwang. The essential point as ever is that Northern Ireland was not built to last and becomes less and less viable with every passing issue or piece of evidence. Brexit championed by the DUP merely hastens its decline. Kevin, thanks very much. And to all our listeners, I'd be really curious to know how many of you have heard of that word before, Zogswang. Zogswang. I'm going to say it one more time. Zogswang. And Kevin uh, coined that phrase in his uh, recent book, I noticed, which basically means that if you're in a game of chess, every move you make brings yourself closer to checkmate, i.e. self-defeat. And Kevin, you're using that phrase to describe the unionists who basically every step they take, they make things worse. I think I seen a, a little comment going across the screen there. I could be wrong. And I, Sean can put in red. I think it was being critical of you saying, you know, this is the sort of language that puts unionists off, um, you know, almost taking pleasure in their discomfort. Now, I didn't see the whole message there, but Kevin, come straight back to that anyway. Do you, have a, do you have a thought or a comment on that, Kevin? Do you think you're being a bit unfair to unionists and how they're responding? Are you there, Kevin? It's on mute. Uh, but sorry, there I am. Yeah, sorry, I pressed mute by mistake. Um, is, uh, what I would say to that is, is that if the view that I put across in the way that I put it across is challenging. It's meant to be. It's not my job to convince people. I'm not a politician. Let the politicians do that. I'm just trying to state what I see as the essential truth of all of this. Um, I think there's enough cant. I think there's enough wrapping things in, 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 in woolly language. Um, and I think a, a, a dose of straight talking with all these issues is probably uh, is probably much warranted. So, so, you know, apologies if you find what I'm saying and how I say it 
a bit blunt, but that's probably because I'm well, living in South Yorkshire, it's probably rubbed off on me. But it <laughs> des- this, some of these truths deserve to be told, I think. Northern Ireland's going out of business. It wasn't built to last. And really? as I say, we're now in the process in which in the next few years, it will cease to exist. It will be voted out of existence in accordance with the Good Friday Agreement by its own people and nobody else. And that, that's, 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 the, that's where we're at. We're in a death spiral in terms, in terms of Northern Ireland's future. And Brexit, as I say, is the accelerant that's brought together all these other issues and, and just provided a very powerful driving force to, 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 to drive Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland together again, politically and yes. economically. Um, Brilliant. And, and unionists, have, unionists have delivered that. That's the great paradox, the great irony of all this. Yeah. All right, Ken, bit of straight talking might upset some people, but you can't beat a bit of straight talking. Look, I've got so many questions, but Sean, Sean, let me go over to you. I can see things coming across the screen with your comments and questions. Is there a fair few of them now, Sean? Because if there is, I'm happy to defer to our, our, our viewers and listeners and people who are on the Zoom. Is there mm-hmm. a common thread emerging, or do you want to throw two or three of those yeah. points out, Sean? I guess... <clears throat> At the moment, there is two main themes coming about. Um, number one is the practicalities of what a united Ireland would look like, but on more of an identity point of view. So things like the national flag, the national anthem, what would these things look like? There was also an interesting comment uh, asking about the role of the monarchy in a united Ireland. Somebody mentioned that um, uh, Scottish independence is indicate is pushing towards the idea of maintaining the British monarchy in some way. I don't know whether that's a substantive claim or not, but the question was kind of, would would a united Ireland have some representation of the monarchy within it to appease unionists in some way? Because that's a question that is coming up when it comes to the practicalities of it, is how do you appease the unionist community um, in this new in this new state? The second one was, um, on a more immediate note, the future of the DUP with the Windsor framework. Um, I think Ben was talking about how Jeffrey Donaldson kind of made a name for himself back in the 1990s with his attitude to the Good Friday Agreement. Um, And there was a couple of mentions in the chat there that if he was to support the, the Windsor framework, and the majority of his party doesn't, the ERG types don't, Um, is that the end of the DUP as we know it? So I think that's probably a a better place to start for now. Okay, well, the DUP as we know it. Sean, thanks. And to our three speakers, I realize there's a danger that we can lose our structure here because I've got all my neatly sort of framed questions, the first half all about the Windsor framework. But let's just freewheel it if you're happy. If you're not, we'll go back to my sort of pre-prepared questions blue peter style bran or ben do you want to pick anything up of, of the comments or anything at all at the moment yeah i'll, I'll, I'll go. i mean for me the key thing in this it's being pragmatic and it's about the economic opportunities and the personal freedom that we can all have i believe through um three hours unity it's uh, as bran said i think the um the protocol does help to embed further the, the all island economy, the economic, you know, you want to call it the economic United Ireland. And that is only going to, that is only going to increase over time. I don't actually, I know some people have said, does the protocol actually weaken the argument for unity? I don't think it does because over the longer term, and I know Kevin has said this elsewhere, I think the UK will ultimately at some future point, at least rejoin the single market or seek to have much better links than they do currently. But I think in the meantime, this gives a real opportunity for uh, Northern Ireland, the region that is currently Northern Ireland, to increase its economic growth. And we should all welcome that. And prosperity is a good thing. And anything that can help us to see an increase in economic prosperity to help us to catch up to the the rest of the island is going to be a good thing. Um, And I think it's about, unfortunately, you know, I take no pleasure in the fact that um, this has been, that, that Brexit hasn't worked out for Unionists, uh, certainly for those who supported Brexit in the way that they thought it would. Um, I don't think that's that's good. I think the key thing is we want to reach out the hand of friendship um, to them and make make it clear that there will be a part for them to play. I don't think that the king or his successors uh, will not be the head of state for uh, a new Ireland. 
I think that's that's a given. But we will all across the island of Ireland have the right to vote for uh, for the head of state to be a president. And I think it'll be key that whoever the president is, she or he must represent everyone across this island. And I think Mary McAleese uh, did some really great work in her, you know, building bridges. But if we look at the current uh, King Charles, he has been on the record. He loves visiting Ireland. He's talked about his desire to visit all 32 counties. If you look at how the late Queen Elizabeth II, the great work that she did visiting visiting Dublin um, and uh, shaking hands with Martin McGuinness. I mean, coming from a unionist background, but being in favour of Irish unity, I find that incredibly moving, seeing the Queen and Martin McGuinness at that time from two diametrically opposed uh, traditions, showing mutual respect and um, making that, that statement and coming together. Um, so I just, I think, I think it, but in terms of, in terms of flags, I think that's going to be further down the line. The key things are housing, healthcare, um, e economy and prospects for our young people and looking after our old and vulnerable people. I think the flags thing, you can, you can look at that down the line. There are examples from elsewhere in Canada and New Zealand where they put together a range of options and then the people voted and only if there was a sufficient demand did they change the flag. And let's not forget that what the, the trickster was originally about was the green white, uh, was the green of nationalism, the orange of unionism, and white representing the peace between the two traditions. And I know coming from a unionist background and growing up in East Belfast, unfortunately, the, the symbolism of the flag was being was changed by the actions of, 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 of certain paramilitary and terrorist groups during the Troubles. And I would hope that the, that, that could be reclaimed. But I think the key thing is let's focus on health, economy, housing, and how we can make sure that everyone has personal freedom. You know, mm -hmm. you marry who you want. You can, women have the, the body, bodily autonomy and that you can live and work across the European continent. And I think those are all key things. Yeah, brilliant, Ben. Brad, did you want to pick up? Yeah, I, do, uh, I, I agree totally with what Ben is saying of the emphasis on the, on the economic side of things, but also to um, Kevin Mayer about uh, the point that he made uh, about what is the North of Ireland for? Um, you know, it was deliberately created as a tribal reservation for unionists 100 years ago, um, and it has been calamitous for unionists. They, they were, they, 100 years ago, almost 70% of the production on the island of Ireland came from the around the counties that uh, centred on Belfast in the northeast. Uh, now, it's the poorest area on the island. It's the poorest region in the UK. It's got the, the worst conditions in almost all respects, either the top or the bottom of whatever scale you want. And you're looking across the border at a prosperous society, which is developing a tremendous uh, modern economic and industrial uh, produce. It's um, one of the top places in Europe for digital economy. It produces most of the, the Botox for the rest of the world and, and County Mayo. Um, and in the north of Ireland, we're stuck with the UK, which is a declining economic state. And there is no regional development system in Britain. So you're, I mean, Michael Gove and Boris Johnson were talking about levelling up, which never happened. But there is no regional development which will produce levelling up for the north of Ireland. It's never going to happen. Their economic prosperity lies on the rest of the island. And unionists have got to think they're, this place was created for them. They're now, now a minority in the north. They are in the poorest part of these islands. So what is the point of the north of Ireland? And the way to move forward is to embrace the economic advantages that Brexit gives and to try to have an all-Ireland economy and produce the sort of stuff that Ben is talking about. Because if you are in an economically united Ireland, your children are going to live longer. They're going to be educated, which is not happening. Again, the North of Ireland education system is failing a large proportion of the population, whereas the South is one of the highest educated countries in the EU. You're going to live longer. You're going to, children are going to be better educated. They're going to be more prosperous. Um, the problem is we're stuck with sentiment and people will sit People don't know this. I mean, you never hear on the BBC the fact that 
Benefits in the South are far superior to benefits in the North. Pensions in the South are far superior to pensions in the North. The economic and benefit system in the UK is one of the worst in the OECD. But nobody talks about that because we don't get any of this stuff on BBC because it is the British Broadcasting Corporation after all. So people have got to be educated about the advantages of living in the South. And the final point I'd make is People 100 years ago said, we don't want to be uh, governed from Dublin because um, home rule is Rome rule. And so that's all gone. It's a mo The South is now a modern state, which is pretty well repudiated. The Catholic Church is now completely discredited. I mean, a couple of years ago, they demolished a church which was built for like 3,000 people. They're going to build it. This is just outside Dublin. They're going to build a new one, which will accommodate 300 uh, the, the social and economic change in the Republic has been absolutely extraordinary. And guess why that has happened? It's because they're in the EU. Brian, that's brilliant, really good. I'm going to ask a question, lads, and I think the three of you might disagree with the, the thrust of the question, but I want to ask it because, again, I've seen somebody's comment going across the screen, but I've had a lot of friends say this to me, and it's this, and it links to what you said, Brandon, your points were brilliant, and they say, sometimes say to me, and the United Islanders, and United Islanders come in different shapes and sizes, and they, they sometimes say to me, they find that the economic argument is a bit cold, it's a sort of cold rationality and lacks a bit of soul, and they say to me, is this it, question, is this it? Is, is this the thing that's going to get us out of bed and motivate us and basically really, it's almost as if they're, they're, they're speaking to the heart, I, I, I think. And I am curious, Brian and Ben and Kevin, what do you think about the idea that there, there are those out there who are United Islanders that don't think the thing that's going to clinch it for us is automatically or exclusively the economic arguments? Have you anything to say to, to people who, who think like that? And seeing you're on the screen, Bran, if you want, you can come back first and then I'll go to Ben or Kevin to see if they've well, got anything. I mean, it's it's true. It? I mean, the, the economic argument is, is, as you say, cold and unemotional. Um, and people here tend <laughs> to vote. You know, when Americans talk about people voting pocketbook or people voting for their purse, that's not what happens here. Um, and there is a lot of emotion and sentiment and fear and that, that should not be underestimated. There's a lot of paranoia among unionists who, who think that they're going to be on the receiving end of what they did to nationalists for 50 years. And so they are terrified in some, some cases of, of a United Ireland because they think that um, it'll all be turned against them. But the big problem is there is no unionist leader who will come and start talking about the future you know, if you ask unionists, how do they see the future in 10 years time or 15 years time? They have no answer. They still see it stuck at exactly the same position as, as it is today. Um, and there, there's no one coming forward because of fear of being lundified as they talk. Um, if you come out and start talking about what you're going to do in the future, you're immediately a traitor and a lundy. I mean, Peter Robinson tried this in 2011. Peter Robinson saw the results of the census coming and he said, they're talking now 12 years ago, that you, you need to start thinking about what the future is going to be. And as he said, look, I've got insurance. I don't think my house is going to burn down, but I've got insurance and I'm concerned I'm able to do something when it may accidentally burn down. There's no one in unionism coming forward and saying, right, show me what you're go we're going to do. Would you accept if I asked for this kind of a flag? Would you accept? They will not talk. They will not come to the table. And the DUP are uh, doing exactly that at the moment. I mean, yeah. remember... It was years and years before they came to any table. They started boycotting in the in the late 80s, and they continued that right through until the St. Andrews Agreement in 2006. It was the Ulster Unionists who moved, but the DUP didn't. And 
they held the majority and they, they scared the majority of the unionist electorate and they will not come to the table. They will not negotiate. Brilliant, Brian. <laughs> and Ben or Kevin, do you have anything to pick up on? You don't have to have yep. anything to say. Yeah, I, would, I mean, the economic facts are, they, they're cold and they're rational, but I think that's a good thing. I think they're the foundation upon which we can build a campaign and an argument and a rationale for why uh, why we should favour Irish unity, because ultimately it has to be about making people's lives better. And, uh, you know, I've said it before, I'll say it again, sovereignty for me isn't a flag on a pole, it's food on a table and a roof over your head. And for both of those things, I think being part of uh, United Ireland in the EU is the best thing. I think it's it's really important to talk about the important role the EU has. It is the most successful peace project that there has ever been on the continent of Europe. You know, until unfortunately the uh, the war in Ukraine, um, we had had the longest period of peace on this continent for hundreds of years, and that's to be welcomed. And I think it is ironic that unionism, or large parts of unionism, are opposed to EU membership, and increasingly appear to be opposed to the Good Friday Agreement, and some are even you know, post the European Convention on Human Rights. Those are all three things that are going to help maintain uh, the, 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 the rights of, uh, of, of unionists in a, in a New Ireland. And I think, that's, I think that's key. And it's about making sure that, that I think we have to put together a package of proposals for unionism and make it clear to them that they will be protected and safeguarded in, in the New Ireland, because Brian's right, that there is a fear there. Um, I think there's a difference between political unionism and civic unionism. Political unionism absolutely has got taken the ostrich strategy of just head in the sand, doesn't want to engage because there's a fear there and a thinking that if they, as soon as they engage, they'll be londified and their, their reason for being representatives and political leaders of unionism will fall away. Whereas civic unionism, I think, is already engaging in this and, and you know, quietly and privately. They may not be doing it publicly much. Uh, there were a few of us uh, from, a, from a unionist background speaking at a recent event in the Ulster Hall. Um, about this, but I think it is, um, it is, there are increasing discussions because it comes back to people want to know what's going to happen to their pension, what's going to happen to their economy. I do think there is a fear as well about uh, the prospect of, of further violence. So that needs to be addressed and we need to work through all that. But I think this is why we need to plan now so we don't have, we can avoid the chaos of Brexit by voting for something without there being a clear plan in place. In place. Brilliant. Just before I go to Kevin, um, Sean, when Kevin's finished, I want you to read out three or four or five comments from people which you think are interesting, uh, and especially if they disagree with any of the speakers, just get them in, and then we'll let Brian and Ben and Kevin pick up what they want. But Kevin, I want to squeeze in an extra question to you, because you and I were chatting for me the other day. And you said something, and I'm not 100% sure I agree with you. So I want to share this with the listeners and the viewers and the panel so you can come back to this question as well. And it's, it's got to do with what they're calling the storm on brick. And it seems to be that the Irish News and the Irish Times and Nationalist United Islanders are pretty much welcoming Rishi Sunak's sort of deal or whatever you want to call it, the Windsor Framework. See that storm on brick. Tell me if I'm wrong, listeners and panellists. This is how I understand the Stormont break, that in essence, the DUP are 30 people within Stormont, which could easily be the DUP and a couple of other unions, can effectively raise something that's akin to um, a petition of consent, although it'll be called something else. And that can effectively stop or block a particular um, EU development or law um, our initiative coming through. And of course, it says that you go to the British government, and the British government will go to arbitration, but they effectively have the veto. And I know that someone compared about going to the boot of your car and looking for the, the wheel underneath the boot and it's hard to get at and blah, 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 blah. But in theory, is it not the case that this storm on break can mean that if that's allowed to happen, that the North diverges from the South in terms of certain EU laws and developments? and that we have a potential here in that uh, Windsor framework where actually the opposite of what we're hoping for can happen, which is that the North basically diverges from the South, which is part of the EU. Now, please put me right and educate me, everyone, if I pick that aspect of the Windsor framework up wrong. Kevin. I think I think that's I think that's broadly correct. I mean, it was Ian Paisley who said uh, on, on Newsnight that oh, it was quite a good analogy, actually. 
he said that the brake is like it's a bit like having a, a brake in the, under, the, under the spare wheel in the boot of your car. I think it's more akin to saying um, you before you apply the brake, if we're going to carry on with the car metaphor, that you have to get the consent of everybody in the car before you can press the brake. And not only that, you've got to wind the window down to the car opposite you and ask for their consent as well. Because, of course, effectively, if, I mean, one remove, what this is, is, is basically a glorified council motion that you kick up to the government and, and, say, and say, we're not happy with this, at which point they could pick it up and run with it, or they could just say, thanks, noted, we don't think it's a serious enough issue. This, this, wins a, this, 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 this break is, is meant to be applied very, very sparingly, in which case it's more like the, the, the break on a train rather than the break on a car. You're not meant to pull the brake, really, unless something catastrophic is happening. And I think that, that's 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 pretty much the, the context in which, in which this this thing this thing has come about. And of course, what happens then is that the British government takes it up, meets with the European Union. The European Union can say no, and then it goes to binding arbitration. So so it's 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 extremely convoluted and multi layered. But it's all about it's all about as I said a few minutes ago. It's, it, there's th there's three three aspects to, to this this Windsor framework. Is one is the bits that were already on the table, which which the European Commission and the Irish government put forward in October 2021, red and green lanes on the basis of shared intelligence about what's crossing the Irish Sea. That was there. Then that was offered up then, and, and the British government at no point from October 2021 onwards until this week has actually formally come back on that point. So so that's that's interesting. The other part is. To be fair to Rishi Sunak, he's managed to winkle out of the, the EU some, some, some concessions about repatriating, as I say, state aid and VAT um, control. It, it shows you what you can do with a constructive attitude. And I think you know, that, that's, that's illustrative of, of, of where we've been for the last few years with people like David Frost and, and, and uh, David Davis and, and Boris Johnson um, just catastrophically mishandling relations with the European Union. And the third part is these powers where, where in effect, there's, there's lots of padding that's gone around them to try and make them palatable um, to, to the ERG and to the DUP and, and to, and to more, more broadly to Northern Irish public opinion. Uh, that, that's a work in progress because as, as we've seen, um, people are starting to th see through some of it and say, actually, this is not, uh, not quite what it seemed, it seemed at the start, but it doesn't matter. This is the only deal. Brian said at the, at the start, this is going through anyway. The vibe is what matters. And the vibe in Westminster and the vibe in the British media is it's a good day's work by Sunak. Uh, this is the end of this kind of tortuous psychodrama about Brexit. A lot of the people that you might have looked at to say they might they might oppose it, they, they might, might cause trouble. I mean, you know, they've literally been dropping like flies this last week. A week ago, Jacob Rees Mogg, for example, was saying that the DUP's position was entirely reasonable in terms of being very sceptical about what was coming. He's now fully on board with, with Sunak's deal. David Davis, the former Brexit secretary, on, on board. Andrea Leadsom, former cabinet minister, one of the faces of the Brexit campaign. She's on board. Steve Baker, former chairman of, of the European Research Group of Tory MPs, one of the Spartans, one of the real hardliners on, on, on Brexit, put in, into the Northern Ireland office. He's been on you know, a, a resignation watch because they thought Steve Baker might not back this. Steve Baker's been effervescent about, about, about Sunak's deal. He's come out in front of the cameras smiling and saying it, it, it's a great deal. So the vibe is great. We're through that. We're past it. On to the next thing. So, so we can pour over, or unionism can pour over the entrails of this as much as it likes. It isn't going to stop it. And, and then, then it's a second question of can we get the assembly and the executive back up and running? And I suspect there'll be a lot of pressure brought to bear, both carrot and stick. We're a few weeks away from a budget, which is usually a good way of buying off support. And we've got the coronation honours, uh, at, which, at which point we may see a few uh, unionist backwardsmen suddenly made knights and all the rest of it. But I'll, I'll tell you this, uh, one to watch for this weekend, the Sunday Times or the Mail on Sunday, one of the papers, there'll be a story from a Downing Street insider saying if the DUP don't back it, then we may be looking at some sort of joint joint authority um, to manage Northern Ireland and change the rules at Storm. That, that's that's the stick bit. That, and I suspect that that will be briefed out over the weekend. Can I, can I, can I get back go on, on the, on go the on, Brian, yes. Um, it's never going to happen. There's a, there's a brilliant blog by a legal expert blogger, David Allen Green. You, uh, anyone can look it up. And David Allen Green's blog on the break is called uh, The Storm and Break Instrument or Ornament. And basically what he demonstrates is it's an ornament. Yeah. It's almost impossible to use it because there's very, as he points out, there's very craftily included in it are in requirements which can never be achieved. And one of them is 
that you've got to show that any legislation that the EU is bringing in is going to cause lasting and persistent damage to communities in the north of Ireland. So it's not just a case of unionists saying, we don't like this because we're diverging from Britain. You've got to bring in communities. And how they're going to prove that is a mystery to anyone who reads it. So it's never going to happen. And it's the sort of thing, it's designed to persuade unionists. And Jeffrey Donaldson bought it. He said, this gives unionists a veto, a very foolish thing for him to say, yeah. because it's designed to, buy, to persuade them to join. So we, we, we go into the executive and then we can block anything. In fact, once they've read it and once their lawyers have looked at it, or if they've read David Allen Green, far from persuading them, it will enrage them that they have been deliberately misled. Yeah. Intra, brilliantly interesting. Um, thank you, Bra Bran and Kevin and Ben for putting me right. And a couple of people in the comments were, were making interesting comments back to me about that question. So thank you for putting me right. Sean, go to our brilliant listeners and viewers and uh, give us two or three or four or five, just things that they're saying that are interesting, comments, questions, and then we'll let our panel listen to, to these comments and they can pick up what they want. Are you there, Sean? Yeah, yeah. So it's on the theme of um, bringing unionists along in uh, in any unified Ireland. You've got Bill Brathnock said that most people with strong identities and emotions on this issue probably have their minds made up already. If you want to win over the floating voters, you've got to argue on the grounds of reason and economic rationale. This going back to the argument that um, the lads were making earlier on. Yeah. Um, Again, say similar similar theme here. How do we ga engage young unionists? Eileen Kelly asked. Uh, Anya McCann said that it's to educate them and bring them to the South. Members of the Workers' Party have been doing this for some years in cross-community projects. Um, duh, duh, duh. We've got a few more, all relatively the same uh, sentiment of how are we bringing along unionists um, how are we appealing to the middle ground? And the theme on that is the economic argument, essentially. Brilliant. Okay. Um, and just um, our three panelists, when they're um, um, thinking me jiggy, having a little think about the things that you just said, Sean, I'm going to throw in two other questions. And these are thinking out loud things which you might not want to come back on because they might be impossible to answer the, the stack of my thinking out loud. It might sound random, but in the context of our discussion, guys, I'm, I'm interested to work out if the North is so dysfunctional that it is irreformable uh, and the extent to which, you know, you should put your efforts into trying to basically make the six counties work. And uh, here's another thing, and this is a thinking out loud point. And I don't mean this to be churlish or selfish because it may come across wrong and I mean it in the best positive way. Is it the case at the minute that basically the momentum towards United Ireland is basically coming from uh, unionist mistakes from Zugwang mm. rather than any real like agency or mass movement in Ireland. Uh, and I, I'm interested to see what, what our speakers think about that, but I do want to caveat or qualify that. Um, I just really want to qualify that by saying there are groups like Ireland's Future who are bloody brilliant and who are leading the way. And it's not in the slightest of criticism of Ireland's future. It's the exact opposite. It's almost as if, how can we get Ireland's future, you know, bigger and better and wider? Um, apologies to listeners and speakers if, and the panel if my two thinking out loud thoughts don't make sense. But um, going back over to the panelists, is there anything from what Sean read out or what I thought about out loud? Um, ben or Kevin or Brian that you'd like to come back on just now? Yeah, can I come back on the, uh, the middle on, Brian. Brian, so to speak? I think one, one of the most heartening things in, in the last five or six years has been the, the movement from young, liberal, educated, professional unionists. And that's exemplified by the North Down election of Stephen Farry a constituency which switched from unionist then to liberal unionist, 
um, and then to uh, Stephen Ferry. And that's an area which also was very hostile to Brexit. And it's interesting, the, the growth of the Alliance Party in places like North Down, Lagan Valley, and other areas which are very prosperous and populated by unionist unions, you know, huge unionist majorities, but the, the, the young unionist, moderate, professional, educated people who are opposed to Brexit and haven't made the leap yet from the DUP to any other serious unionist position, but they're going to the Alliance Party. And the Alliance Party is doing extremely well. Places like Lagan Valley, Strangford, North Down, that sort of circle around Belfast. And who's voting for them? It isn't nationalists, because there aren't enough nationalists to elect them. But those are the sort of people who elected um, of the, the uh, young alliance woman, uh, Olin, who unfortunately resigned from politics the other day. That's how she got elected. Those were the people who did it. Um, and the fact that she was the first woman to be elected in North Antrim says a lot. So there's hope there that these people are thinking. The problem is there aren't enough of them joining political parties. Why? Because there's no political party for them to join because they're going to be treated as Lundies. I mean, you mentioned Ireland's future, and I obviously declared an interest since I'm on the, on the board of Ireland's future. But we have worked so hard to try to get unionists mm -hmm. to come public and express. I mean, Ben is one of the, the uh, uh, more successful ones that, that does come out and say these things, but others, have been attacked and abused and threatened, and they're just afraid to do it. Um, but there is hope there um, yeah. that these people can come forward. The, what we really need, I think Sean was saying that, um, to explain what is there and what is available. And for that, we need a citizens assembly. So that people can come together and produce a set of proposals. The big bugbear in all this, is the Irish government, which is supposed to be talking about Irish unity. And you have Simon Coley and Leo Varadkar saying yeah. they'd love to see United Ireland in their lifetime. It's an extraordinary thing. We have politicians saying, these are my aspirations. I'm doing precisely nothing to yes. the aspirations. And another, Sam in the move for asking naive questions. Here's another one. What, is it not? Is it possible? Is it a stupid thought to think? Well, if the Dublin government won't do anything, let's let's bypass them and try and find a couple of million quid or euro and and, and get some like impartial neutral body to conduct and carry out that citizens assembly um, rather than wait for the for the Irish government to perhaps or possibly never get around to it. Do you think that's a, a go or is that just silliness? I don't, I don't know. I think, I mean, it, it has to come from Irish people. But let's be clear about this. The process doesn't belong to any political party or indeed mm -hmm. an Irish government, because if they make a proposal, it's automatically going to be rejected. It has to come from the people. And the model that we should be looking at is the sort of thing that happened with the Eighth Amendment, where the government was able to get proposals for abortion and say, it, is, it wasn't our fault, folks. It was these people who did it. Yes. So nobody, yes. Has, you cannot have a political party owning the proposals for Irish unity. Yep. It has to be from citizens. Absolutely. Um, Kevin or Ben, do you want to pick up on anything, lads? I realise we're freewheeling a wee bit here, so if you don't want to pick up on anything, that's fine. Can I just just pick up on the, on the point that about, about the economy and the economic argument? Because I think I think that's. Yep. That's, that's really important. I mean, I, I, my heart always sinks when people start talking about flags and anthems and all the rest of it, because it's it's a cul-de-sac. Uh, I can't convince an Orangeman not to be an Orangeman. I can't convince somebody that's lost somebody um, by the, uh, the hands of the IRA that the Irish flag it, it represents them and, and their, their community. I can't do that because, because it's very difficult and very visceral and people have very strong opinions on it. I can't do much about that. What I can do is sell you a United Ireland that is better for you and your family in terms of translating that economic argument into jobs and prosperity and opportunity, and also doing it bloody quickly as well. If what we've yeah. seen in the last two years with the, with with, with because of the protocol, the the, the trade, um, uh, uh, the, the changes in in trade 
east west and more, much more north south activity you know huge amounts of of trade switching very very quickly because of the protocol um you know you can translate the success of of the, of the southern irish economy and 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 bring the north into that policy framework and the north will benefit very very quickly i mean you know to be able to say to to some of the the communities in East Belfast, which are some of the most benighted, not just in, in, in the UK, and as Brian says, definitely on the island of Ireland, which is a real paradox from 100 years ago, where this was the economic powerhouse of Ireland. But, but in terms of Western Europe as well, the social mobility of young Protestant boys in parts of East Belfast is the lowest in Western Europe. It's atrocious. Now, now if you could sort of say, because of the benefits of Irish unity economically, whether people buy this politically and culture and identity, I can't, you know, as I say, I can't do much about that. But economically, the benefits would be felt very, very quickly. If you could save up fifty thousand jobs in the, in the first two years into parts of East Belfast, decent, high, high, you know, high, high skilled, high wage jobs, it would be absolutely transformational. And I think, I think there's a there's a very big positive offer that can be made, which needs to be fleshed out. And you're absolutely right. You can't wait for an Irish government or for, for Sinn Fein to possibly win, win an election and possibly after that at some stage set things in train it needs to happen now and there's lots of people can jump in and, and, and help to do that because the case is begging to be made and it's it's you know it we've got a it's a rational case it's a rational argument the big difference there's two differences between where, where united islanders are and where scottish independence campaigners are the first is because of the good friday agreement there is a legal uh, right to have a border poll if and when of course we can we can show that there's a there's demonstrable demand for it but it's a legal right that's not the same in scotland which is why they've got some of the problems they've got the second one is the economic argument for irish unity is incredibly strong the scottish case in 2014 was a little bit hooky it was tied to the oil price which promptly crashed after the result and all, and all the rest of it and and there are still challenges there it, it, you know scotland's a great country great assets definitely can make a go of it but but the case for a united island is is just so much more granular it's so much more advanced it's so much more demonstrable it's completely rational you know the southern the southern irish economy is the most dynamic probably in western europe and and and, and you know generates huge amounts of growth huge amounts of great jobs and actually for people in the south why would you want northern ireland well you need domestic market you need domestic workers you know otherwise otherwise as we're seeing and, and it's causing obviously some some friction with, with mm. inward migration in, in, into the south causing problems well you've got two million irish people whether whether everybody owns that identity or not but they are literally on the island of ireland um, who can who can be brought into your workforce so there's a very powerful rational argument and you have to juxtapose that with the irrational argument, and, and we've seen a lot of that with the DUP and with the, their reaction to, to the protocol, where because we've seen these changes in trade, the cry went up at the start, we can't get things on shelves, it's, a, it's an absolute disaster. And of course, this was demonstrably untrue. Inflation, you know, inf inflation in Northern Ireland is actually lower than it is in the rest of the UK, which kind of says actually there isn't really supply problems. Things might have changed. The branding on your, on, on your, on your cereal packets might have changed, but basically you can still get you can still get cereal. And we have this insane sort of sort of argument that 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 you know you, you know some unionist politicians, not just in the DUP, kind of railing against the dying of the light on on, on this issue. As though, as, though, as though the decisions that finance directors in independent companies have made, which is to say, if we're going to have problems bringing stuff across from Britain into the north, then if I can source it in the south, happy days, it doesn't matter to me, I've got to get my business to, to work. And we've had unionist politicians say, no, 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 you can't do this. And we've had this extraordinary situation where capitalism has, been, has joined the pan-nationalist front, apparently, where, where, where they're railing against just these, these sovereign decisions of businesses. You know, you know, business will find a way. Um, jobs are there for the taking. Investments there for the for the for the taking. You know, we can make the lives of people in the north so much dramatically better than they are now, and their prospects so much more you know, dramatically good. But the person who sort of said this is a bit of a cold argument. It's a fair point. It's, it's the responsibility of everybody that wants to see Irish unity to be able to flesh this out, I think, in much, much greater detail. We've painted in the last few years all the landscape of, of this issue, but we need to paint in the foreground the detailed public policy responses. How will this work? What will an all island health service look like? Pensions, you know, infrastructure, shared, you know, new public services, shared public services. And and as I say, how we how we drive um, jobs and prosperity and make people in the north benefit disproportionately from that 
great Kevin, stop me in my tracks that line there, cap was in for you now that I <laughs> I can see that in the banner somewhere, it's going to make me laugh, but um, this is what I'm going to do, everybody, I'm going to go to Ben if Ben wants to say anything, and after Ben says whatever he wants to say, Sean, I'm going to go to you, and then we're coming towards the end, because I am determined to, to finish by eight o'clock, so what I want you to do, Sean, after Ben, is really is out, you know, for the final time, two or three or four or five or six comments that people are saying. And by the way, they flash through my screen and I can't see them on time, but I seen one that said the person was an Alliance counselor and I'm interested to see who that person was and what they said, Sean. So let me know what that person said. Um, and then after Sean finishes speaking, Brian and Kevin and Ben, that'll be you then to come back to pick up anything from what the the, the viewers and listeners were saying, but also your final thoughts and comments, what you want to leave us with on this discussion, Brexit and the protocol, Bob for the Union, Good Ferris Unity question mark. So that's giving you a little bit of warning in advance. Ben, did you want to say anything now? Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I think one of the reasons that is given for the Irish government not being more proactive on the question of unity is because of the ongoing friction around the protocol issue but now the fact that we have this Windsor framework and it's likely to go through that removes that so I guess we will get to see the true colour of the money of our current government and I think um, I think it was Tad, Tad who said that um, the uh, there is the question about whether the existing government particularly the, the two civil war parties whether they actually want seeing out of Ireland because their 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 voter base their their power base could be eroded yeah. That could well be right. I'm very aware of the fact that in Cyprus there was a vote for reunification and northern Cyprus that was occupied by Turkey that was more impoverished voted in favour of reunification and southern Cyprus that was independent and prosperous didn't. So I don't take for granted that uh, the south of Ireland will, will automatically vote for it. Um, I think we do have to have that blended approach of both the economic argument and the, you know, reclaiming the, the fourth green field, but it has to be a mixture. Um, I think in terms of um, addressing the issue, absolutely a citizen's assembly, and I think breaking it down into key sectors of how do we make a housing system work on an oil island basis, how do we make infrastructure, health and so on is key. And the other point I'd make is, it looks like we're gonna have a um, labor, or we're likely to have a labor led UK government. Don't forget that Peter Kyle, the shadow secretary of state has said that if they come into government, they will set out the criteria for a border poll. Now on the basis that that is gonna be fair and equitable, that has to be welcome because that will hopefully provide focus that we can no longer put this to one side. I agree with Peter Robinson that we all have to plan for this. And I think that'll be a good thing. Hopefully that can address some of the concerns. And if we work through that detail, that gives us all a pathway so that we know what we're voting for. And I would hope we can get to a point where actually the vote isn't going to be a big question of whether it's going to pass or not. It'll actually confirm what we will have already agreed through an iterative process of working through what we want the New Ireland to look like. Ben, great and really, really good, Ben. And then, Sean, mate, this is the last time. I want to get a, give us a good feel because I can't really see them and give our speakers a good feel. Um, whatever you want, pick out two or three or four or five things and then our speakers will come back and they may pick up on what our listeners and viewers were um, talking about or they might just have like Blue Peter style, one that prepared earlier, a finishing remark about the title of the actual discussion, but it doesn't have to be about the title of the discussion you finish with our panelists. It can be whatever you want. Sean, over to yourself. Yeah, so I've um, I found our counsellor in the chat, Gavin Walker. Um, he replied and said, Kevin, as an Alliance counsellor, I agree with your economic argument, but I know from personal experience that logical arguments have a limit to their effectiveness when talking to unionists. Um, a fair few comments in that sim similar vein of um, pinning everything on economics. Um, we've got, if you base the question of Irish unity on supposed economic prosperity, it'll just turn people off. It was tried during the EU referendum and it failed. Emotion trumps all else when it comes to voting. We've got... If the next election in 2024 produces an outcome which shows unionism taking more votes and or seats the nationalists, what does that mean for the objective of Irish unity? And finally here, sadly, the DUP don't do logic. The only language they seem to understand, understand is tradition and intransigence. 
That's brilliant. And um, th thank you very, very much, Sean, to all the people who were commenting and so on and so forth and uh, making points. So this is it, lads. We're, we've, we've got about seven or eight minutes to eat. Um, final thought, can pick up like anything you want from what people said or what the speaker said, or it can be just a reference back to the motion of our debate, or it could be, if you want, instead about any wise thoughts you might have about the, the, the direction of travel for for the unity movement, whatever you want. And, um, you know, in terms of who speaks first, I, you know, I don't really mind. Ben, why don't you go first? This okay. No, you just, uh, go on, Ben. Are you happy okay. to finish off? That? Yes. Ben, go on. Yep, go yep. on, final word. Uh, I saw, I saw one, of the, um, one, of the, one of the viewers was talking about reconciliation. I think that's absolutely key. We do, we do need to see this is, this is the process. This is not about one side winning over the other. This is about how we all win on the island of Ireland. And also it's really important not just about relations within the island of Ireland, but, but, but about relations between Ireland and Britain. Ireland has been a source of friction within, within, uh, with Britain for, a hundred, for hundreds of years. But I think this is, you know, removing the border won't end all division, but it will remove a major source of division. And I think it's about once we can do that and by working together and assuring people that their rights and identity will be respected, giving them making it clear that this is the best way for peace and prosperity for everyone, regardless of where they're from. David uh, McWilliams has made the point that there are more foreign born people living on the island of Ireland than there are Unionists. Um, and that just shows how the island of Ireland has changed. But this is, not, this is about how we can work together. And I, I think it's really important. Being in favour of Irish unity does not mean you're anti-British, far from it. I want us to have good relations with, Brit with, with British people and with Britain. And I think King Charles has done some great work on that, and that provides uh, a good a, a good framework. But I just I think that um, I, I think if we can build peace and prosperity, and we can move away from this jingoistic Brexit approach of it's all about a zero sum game, and it's about I have to win and you have to lose. To how can we win together? And I don't mean that in any trite way. The way that we do that is by looking at how do we build the best healthcare, housing, economy options for our kids and I think it's about having a peaceful prosperous outward looking liberal Ireland that is that is that is united with represent, representation for all on a, on a unified basis um, and, and it's firmly anchored within the EU. And brilliant mate thank you very much brilliant as ever and Kevin we'll go to yourself and then we'll finish with Brian if that's all right Kevin. I'll just, just just give a few reflections and just touch on a, on a couple of things possibly from from a view on this side of the Irish Sea, really, because because you know there are three dimensions to this whole issue. There's there's agreement and and, and consent in the north for constitutional change. There's consent, of course, on the island of Ireland. But of course, there's the third dimension, which which is what does British public opinion, the British media, and 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 Westminster kind of think about all of this. I was just very struck. I think it was something that it was initially said about the role of the monarch. Um, and, and it was very interesting to see the role of the monarch this week, because obviously King Charles was wheeled out, if monarchs are wheeled anywhere, um, to, to have tea with uh, Ursula von der Leyen after she'd had a press conference with Rishi Sunak. And of course, this new concordat bears um, his secular name, the, the Windsor um, the, the, the Windsor framework. Now, you might say, well, that's just because they met in Windsor, but they met in Windsor because she was having tea with King Charles. And it just strikes me as a fairly... Um, unsubtle prompt um, from, from a British um, conservative and unionist prime minister to unionist politics to say, get with the programmes, lads, because I've got the king on side and he wants you to do it as well. Now, of course, King Charles hasn't said anything on, on all of this, but, but the, the, the optics, as they say in the US, are fairly compelling about all of this. You know, Sunak has raised the stakes, I think, quite a lot to say, this is the best deal that anyone can get, frankly. Um, it's the only deal anyone can get. I can't get rid of the protocol. It's not wise to anyway, because as I say, it's zero sum. You check, you check the goods at the ports, you check them on the border in the island of Ireland, that's a no-no. So we're back to the protocol. And that, that's the gist of it. So we've had all these years of people walking around this issue and kicking the tires of it year after year to, to get back to basically where we were at the, at the very start. But it's just striking to me that, that for, for, for the position that political unionism finds itself in today, particularly the DUP, where it's on the wrong side of a Tory prime minister, a Tory government, the British parliament, the British Supreme Court, 
and now the British monarch. You know, we had we had Sammy Wilson say say, say that Prince Ch uh, King Charles, as of course you know is, uh, would come to regret um, his involvement with as he sees it the selling of this deal last week. So the DUP now don't even like the the, the British monarch, and, and you know. I can only ponder that perhaps we should be calling them disloyalists um, these days because I don't know who, who, whose side they're on, I don't know who they like anymore, because, because the rational decisions that, that will, will apply from this side of the Irish Sea will be, we made a deal in the Good Friday Agreement, once the Irish on the island of Ireland do the heavy lifting, once Dublin shows willing, and once it looks as though, you know, a few opinion polls aside, there is kind of consent to test the proposition of constitutional change because that's all we're doing we're having a referendum it might go either way that Westminster is supremely relaxed with all this happening and, and, and it just just struck me that that you know Sunak raised the ante with the DUP this week by by involving King Charles it wasn't lost on Arlene Foster it wasn't lost on on Sammy on Sammy Wilson but the fact that he did it I think is really significant and it, and you know I mean, I've said before that you, we could have a scenario here quite easily where where the referendum on a united island is called by a conservative government and i think that this week just illustrates that Gavin, brilliant thank you very much last but not absolutely least bran over to yourself okay. for your closing remarks please i think um i think it's very important to uh refer to this sort of the idea of a zero sum game which i think is now over because the tectonic plates are moving and they're moving in the direction of some kind of accommodation because they said earlier young professional educated unionists are looking for a way out of this but the other thing is there is enormous demographic dynamic uh, movement and <clears throat> the result of that will be a border poll before the end of this decade and the people who will vote for Irish unity are already born there's no way out of that and what we really need to do is to have Sinn Féin, DUP, unionists sitting down together and talking out what they're going to do about this. So we, if there's going to be a border poll. Uh, the, we've got to sit down and plan for it. And one of the ways of doing it is a citizens' assembly. But we all know what happened with Brexit when nobody knew what the outcome of Brexit was going to be or where they were going to be. So it's essential to sit down and plan because this is going to happen before the end of the decade. And the you know the census report. If you look at the the developments in the census report, the the change in the population is rapid and accelerating, and we've got to plan where we're going. And that's essential because, as I say, the zero sum game is over and there is now movement and the movement is in one direction and that's towards Irish unity. Brian, that, that's a brilliant, brilliant finish. Thank you very, very much. And guys and listeners and viewers, can I just say out loud before we all wrap up and you switch off, thanks a million to, to Brian and, and to Kevin and to Ben. And thanks also to um, Sean reading out the comments and thanks to Harley who I'm not sure anybody ever seen sees but Harley's in the background making sure everything runs smoothly and can I add one more thank you and that's to Jerry Carlyle of Ireland's Future because um, Jerry did a wee bit of promotion and sent it round to the database of Ireland's Future and I did notice that our numbers really shot up a fair bit so Jerry thanks for the wee, the wee heave from, from your direction it's much appreciated and, and, and everybody apart from that there have a lovely evening. I'm, I'm glad you tuned in and uh, I look forward to uh, events on the whole question of uh, Irish Union on both sides of the water sooner rather than later. So to everyone, thanks a million guys and all the best. Okay. Thanks Bye. guys. Bye-bye.